Hey, give it back! Why? You don't need any more. You're a disgusting fat pig. Mom, Jeff called me a disgusting fat pig. Jeff, do not call your sister a fat pig. Well, she is turning into a little porker. See, even Dad thinks you're a fat pig. I was teased a lot because oh, I'm so overweight. Pig, but we still eat it anyways. Actually, some vegetarians eat fish. A lot of it was behind my back, but then a lot of it was also to my face, which made me feel terrible. Hi. Hi. Wouldn't it be quicker if you just smeared that on your thighs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you say carbs? You're so big, you're blocking the sun. Wait, you got a little chocolate right there. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one. This sort of thing happens all the time. My name is Emmy, and as the first plus-size supermodel, trust me, I know what it's like to be judged based on my size. But I'm also a mom, and now one of my life's greatest passions is to be a part of creating a world where children can grow up happy, successful, and fulfilled at any size. I hope you're willing to join me in that effort. During this program, we're going to take a look at what weight bias is, how it shows up at home and school, who its victims and sources are, what its consequences are, and what we as parents and teachers can do to improve the lives of children we're surrounded by. But first, let's take a look at how prevalent this problem is. Obesity in children and adults has doubled in the past 20 years. Alarmingly, it's tripled in teens. One in five American children is overweight, and overweight children tend to become overweight adults. 30% of adults are obese, and we're right on track for this trend to continue. There are many efforts underway to address childhood obesity, but we aren't going to solve the nutritional and lifestyle changes that plague our nation in the next 20 minutes. But what we are going to do is share with you some new perspectives and tools that can help you as parents and teachers stem the tide of prejudice in our school system and even at home so that children do not remain vulnerable to the negative impact of bias and stigma and so that we may all begin to treat the many overweight and obese people already in our lives fairly. Hey, Ralph, what's that, your lunchbox? <laughs> Ralph, I know. <laughs> hey, Ralph. <laughs> Peers are frequent perpetrators of weight bias, with school being the most common setting. Teasing can be in the form of verbal and physical aggression, as well as social exclusion. Many students face this torment daily. It takes a toll on their emotional and physical health and reduces their quality of life. One study even found that the quality of life for obese children is as low as children with cancer. My friend um, was picked on by a teacher who um, he, he called her um, like chubby and stuff, and I just thought that was very uncalled for, and a teacher shouldn't say some, anything like that. 24% of overweight boys and 30% of overweight girls experience prejudice in middle school. That bias doubles in high school, where 58% of adolescent boys and 63% of adolescent girls are the victims of peer teasing. Oh God, here comes the earthquake. <laughs> I've heard my friends talking about a girl who's only slightly heavier than me and like making fun of her. And it makes me wonder what they've said behind my back. Unfortunately, attitudes towards weight among children worsen over time. We know that 
Weight bias begins as early as age three in preschool and continues throughout elementary school, middle school, high school, and even college. So overweight and obese children are vulnerable targets of weight bias throughout their educational careers. Studies show that children as young as three years old view overweight peers as mean, stupid, ugly, unhappy, lazy, having few friends, and undesirable as playmates. This all just based on the size of their bodies by three years old. Where does this come from? Weight stigma comes from a series of experiences that people have just looking around them in the culture. They see how their parents discuss the issue of weight. They see how peers in schools discuss it. They see overweight people ridiculed on television shows and made fun of by comics and the like. And because of this, um, they develop quite negative attitudes that are very difficult to change. By the time that children are in high school and college, they are experiencing multiple forms of weight bias, not just verbal comments or physical aggression, but also relational victimization in the form of social exclusion. A lot of people assume that overweight people are dumb or lazy, but most of the time that's not the case. In fact, I do well in school, I get good grades, I'm part of the drama program, I exercise and I dance after school, so it's not, it, in most cases, it's not true. People are afraid of what's different from them. And so by making them as less of a, less of a person, then I guess they feel empowered. Behind their back, they might talk about, oh, look at that shirt she was wearing. Her stomach's popping out and everything. I can't believe she'd even think of wearing something like that. They'll just say like all these like fat jokes about like like wide load coming through and all this stuff and it hurts me to see people getting treated because I see how sad they are. Most of the comments I get from them because some of them are my friends, they say they heard comments like that before and you just get used to it. And that's a problem, that you're getting used to it. That's something you're not supposed to get used to. From nursery school through college, overweight students experience ostracism, discouragement, and unfortunately, even violence. For overweight students, the school experience is one of ongoing prejudice, unnoticed discrimination, and almost constant harassment. Overweight children are more likely than normal weight children to be victims of bullying. Obese children aged 12 to 16 are more often the victims of repeated group aggression or mobbing. And sadly, as a defense mechanism, some of them resort to becoming bullies themselves because they have nobody to turn to for support or help. I've seen a couple kids that have been teased turn into bullies because they basically are trying to get back at everybody that has teased them and even people that haven't teased them. And it's just they want to put on this tough guy reputation and it just turns them into a bully. The diet and beauty industries bombard us day in and day out with the myth of the achievable, perfect body, perpetuating the cultural premium we place on thinness. I think they might think that fat people are nasty just because they don't have the body of a supermodel or something, because they supermodels don't even have that body. They're retouched by computers, so why does everybody think that everyone has to look like that? Clothes shopping is one of my least favorite times of year, like going back to school and having to get a new wardrobe. And lots of times, the clothes don't fit. I hate shopping. Well, it might be fun if anything actually fit. Let's just go home. You've got to find something. You can't go naked. Fashion's stupid. Why can't I just wear something I already have? Because nothing you have fits. It, it makes me feel so, like, ugly. Weight stigma, blame, and intolerance are not constructive motivators for weight loss. They can actually have the opposite effect. Our research shows that social pressure and stigma do not motivate weight loss and in fact have the opposite effect. For example, we surveyed over 2,400 adults who were overweight and obese and asked them about their experiences of stigma. And we found that people reported coping with stigma by eating more food and refusing to diet. My parents try to be supportive, but most of it just makes me feel worse. They say things to try and get me to lose weight but it doesn't help at all, and it kind of makes me want to eat more. 
Victims of weight bias are more susceptible to loneliness, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, poor body image, and suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Look at this list. Is this what we want for our children? Certainly not. But this is what weight stigma gives them, a quality of life that no parent would wish for their child. We also know from research that children who experience weight bias are more likely to engage in unhealthy eating behaviors like binge eating and are more likely to avoid physical activity, both of which may only reinforce additional weight gain and obesity. Ramifications of stigma on quality of life continue into adulthood. One study that I found particularly alarming was that women who were overweight as children or teenagers still suffered significant wage penalties, even after they lost the excess weight. Weight bias is very socially acceptable in North American society. It's rarely challenged and it's often ignored. And as a result, overweight and obese individuals have very little support when they confront weight bias and as a result may internalize negative stereotypes and blame themselves for the negative attitudes that they see. The stereotypes that characterize overweight and obese people as dumb, unsuccessful, stupid, or lazy simply aren't true. Think about the overweight people already in your life. Family members, friends, co-workers, children. Maybe even you've had a struggle with your weight in the past. We know that many people who are overweight are intelligent, successful, friendly, and capable of achieving the same goals as someone who is not overweight. People who are obese are just like everybody else. They live, they breathe, they think, they're just like everyone else. Just because they're a little heavier than other people doesn't mean that they're less of a person. Right. Maybe they may have a couple extra pounds, but that's it. Underneath it all, they're all just like us. Expressing negative attitudes towards obese people has become one of the last accepted forms of prejudice and can be as hurtful and difficult to counter as racial prejudice. Um, I see teachers like say something in passing and they don't even realize that it's offensive and they just the teachers aren't any better than the students sometimes. I found a lot of the teachers weren't as sympathetic as I thought um, that you would imagine a teacher should be and the support really wasn't there for some of his his years uh, and it really hurt him it hurt him a lot. You just feel low, like low, and you just don't know what to do. So you make, you try to, you try to comfort yourself with food or um, games inside all day or stuff like that. Overweight youth are not only teased at school, but peer harassment can come in the form of verbal teasing, physical bullying, or social rejection from family members too. You're a disgusting fat pig. Well, she is turned into a little porker. It's nothing you have fits. What if your child is the victim of weight bias? Here are some suggestions of ways to talk to your child about these issues and find ways to intervene, offer support, and help your child cope. How's your day? It was all right. Just all right? Yeah. I think one of the most important things that needs to happen between a parent and a child is open communication. And that's really the groundwork that needs to be you know, set from the beginning. So you want to have a relationship with your child where they feel like they can come and talk to you about a range of things. So things that are going well in their lives and then things that aren't going so well. And one way to facilitate that is for the parent to try to retain somewhat of a neutral stance when their child starts telling them about a difficult situation. These boys, um, they call me fat. I don't really know who they are. Oh, sweetie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happened. When did that happen to you? At lunch. If your child has had their self-esteem damaged through a situation where someone has discriminated against them because of their weight or bullied them because of their weight, I think parents need to be very direct and tell them that, A, that they did not deserve to be treated this way, 
and also to remind them of all the strengths they have as a person. So how did that make you feel? It really hurt. Um, I felt like no one was there for me and nobody had my back. Well, you know I have your back always, right? And, uh, you know Mrs. Johnson, your English teacher? I think she's somebody that you could go to and turn to. She loves you, you know that. She, she said such lovely things about you at the open house. Okay, and I think that's someone you can trust and turn to. All right, sweetie? Okay. Well, fortunately, schools have developed policies and procedures to deal with bullying in recent years. They're much more aware of these problems. So it makes sense for the parent to work with their child on a plan to go to the school, talk with a guidance counselor, a principal, maybe a trusted teacher, and really think about the best way that the child should handle themselves in school to avoid future situations. So what can we do at home or in the classroom? As parents and teachers, there's a lot we can do. The first step to changing any stereotype or eradicating prejudice is to be aware Start paying attention to your own attitudes about weight. Educate yourself about the causes of obesity so that you will be informed, so that you can help your children and students understand the various causes of obesity. The causes of obesity are very complex. It is a combination of genetic factors, environmental factors, psychological factors, and it's important to recognize that so that when we look at someone and we see whatever their body weight is, we don't make assumptions about their behaviors based on that information. There's genetics involved. It's not just like eating too much because I eat better than, any, than a lot of the people that I know and I exercise more. It's just the way I am. Another thing that people can do, parents and teachers in particular, to change the environment of our children is what we call avoid fat talk. And fat talk kind of goes like this. It's when one person says, oh, I feel so fat today. And then the other person says, oh, no, you're not fat. I'm fat. Look at my thighs. And then the other person says, oh, no, your thighs look great. I'm the one who's really fat. This is a problem because when people talk this way, they are communicating to children, number one, that your body size is a very important thing, and number two, that how you feel on any given day is gonna be related to whether or not you're feeling fat that day. Be alert to both overt and subtle forms of peer harassment that occur in the classroom or on the playground, and intervene when you see weight-based teasing. Encourage your students to intervene and stand up for their peers. Hi. Hi. Wouldn't it be quicker if you just smeared that on your thighs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you say carbs? What's your problem? What are you, the pig's keeper? <laughs> just leave her alone, okay? Fine, Fine. Whatever. whatever. My brother saw people making fun of me at school one day, and he came and he stood up for me. And it makes me feel good to know that somebody accepts me for who I am. One problem right now is that it's very rare for children to see role models who are not very thin or do not have an ideal body type. So one thing that parents and teachers can do is they can really seek out those sorts of individuals and hold them up as role models for children. So they can look in the media, they can look into sports or other, t other celebrities and find people who can serve as role models and really represent very diverse body types. Be sensitive to situations of potential embarrassment for overweight students. I actually spoke with a parent once who told me about her daughter who was in kindergarten, that when she arrived for school, the teacher had set up this special table and chair in a completely separate area of the classroom off away from the other children because the teacher felt that the child would not fit into the regular desks. This is really an example of how it is communicated to the child, you don't fit in here, you don't belong here. Treat weight tolerance with the same significance as you would racial or religious tolerance. Try to promote awareness of weight bias. Be a role model by enforcing a zero tolerance policy of weight-based teasing in your classroom. Oh God, here comes the earthquake. Hey! <laughs> you go, Ralph! Come on, Ralph!
the Rudd Center, we work hard to eliminate the problem of weight bias. We believe that there's a, a strong social injustice occurring here, that hundreds of millions of people around the world are deeply affected by this, and it just doesn't need to occur. Race bias doesn't need to occur, gender bias doesn't need to occur, and weight bias doesn't need to occur. We all want the same things for our kids, don't we? Happy, healthy childhoods. Thank you so much for joining us today and in the future as we strive to improve the quality of life for our kids through not just physical activity and nutritious eating, but by creating a world where we all can be successful and fulfilled at any weight. For more information, please visit the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity at Yale, RuddCenter.org.